Dave said I'm Doug Roberts from PS21. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm a longtime Portsmouth resident, uh, and I uh, own the website PortsmouthNH.com. Uh, PS21, Portsmouth Smart Growth for the 21st Century, is a nonprofit group that um, puts on informational events about planning. Uh, this is our fifth event. Uh, we had uh, a full crowd. Uh, last full house last night at uh, theater by the, uh, <laughs> showing my age there <laughs> at uh, Seacoast Repertory Theater and uh, there were a lot of very positive and even excited comments afterward about Jeff's presentation. Um, we think that uh, people in Portsmouth care about the city and they want to discuss development and they want to discuss it in an informed way. So with that in mind, we invited uh, Jeff Speck, who is one of the nation's leading urban planners, to speak here in Portsmouth. Jeff has dedicated his career to making, determining what makes cities thrive. He spent 10 years as director of town planning for Duwani Platers Eiberg, a leading practitioner of the new urbanism. He's known for his book, Walkable City, which is the best-selling design book of 2013 and he co-wrote the influential earlier books, uh, Suburban Nation and the Smart Growth Manual. Jeff re recently re relocated his design company, Speck & Associates, from Washington, D.C. to the Boston area. Um, to make this event happen, uh, there was a lot of organizations and people involved. Primary funding was provided by the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation and the City of Portsmouth. Uh, there were also contributions from Esther's Marina, PortsmouthNH.com, the <coughs> Scottaqua Savings Bank, and numerous individuals and businesses. Uh, additional support came from Seacoast Local. Uh, we also want to thank uh, City Manager John Bohanko for his early support, and again, the, the City's Planning uh, Department for its assistance with uh, last night's and today's events. Um, Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the members of PS21 who, who are here today that, uh, who helped with plan the event. Um, Peter Vandermark, um, Joe Calderola, and uh, Patrick Healy, uh, Karen Marsloff, uh, Jerry Zellin, and Grace Lesnar are also, we're not he here today, but they're a big help. So with that, uh, Jeff Speck. Thank you, Doug. Hi, everybody. Am I live? Yes. Okay. Um, actually, forgive me. I'm going to... Unlike the theater last night, it's not frigid in here. I'm going to take my jacket off. Roll, we can roll up our sleeves. So the big question, who was not here? Who, who, who did not see me last night? Raise your hand. Who did see me last night? It's about half and half. Um, I th the big quandary I always have is whether to repeat myself or not. And, um, and I think if, if there were, I don't need to be doubly, doubly amplified. I, th I think if there, were, um, if there were only a few folks who were new, I would, um, I would try not to repeat myself. But there's a lot of new folks. And um, what I've realized is over <laughs> like 60 times since the book came out, giving talks on the subject that's in the book, is that I'm slowly figuring out the best way to communicate all the issues that I want to share. And so I have to apologize to those who've heard me before that you're going to hear some of the same jokes some of the same phrasing. And, um, and I guess it's an apology, but it's not an apology. There's a separate lesson here, which is kind of the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours argument, which is that, that you do, when you do something over and over again, you do figure out the best way to do it. And actually, to really let you inside, let you see the ghost inside the machine, and I learned this from Andre Stuani, um, the key is not, th there's two keys. One is first figuring it out, and the second is to make it sound fresh. And as you do it more and more, it's the second challenge that becomes more challenging. But I, uh, when I apologize to folks that you're going to hear some of the same stuff again, a lot of the same stuff again, 
We do have time this morning to get into more detail. So even though it sounds the same, you'll be learning, you'll be learning more things on top of that. But, but I, I'm hoping to teach a second lesson. If you're here twice, it's because you're probably are, you've, you've, as, as someone said to me, you've already drunk the Kool-Aid. And you want to advocate for these things too, yourself. So I hope that, that you'll, you won't, when you hear me say something you've heard me say before, don't think, oh, he said this before. But think, hmm, this may be the best way, at least this is the best way Jeff could figure out to convince other people of this argument. So hopefully it will be useful for you, not just from an informational point of view, but from a rhetorical point of view. Because as, as I've learned from many of my conversations with you uh, this morning and last night, it's, it's, um, it's winning the arguments often that's more important than figuring out the techniques. <laughs> so, uh, and, and I will say, if you're hearing this for the second time, I've had to hear it like a hundred times. <laughs> and I still enjoy it, because it's so important. So um, with, with, with no further ado, and thanks again um, for PS21. And, the, and it's so great that, who here is city staff? Yeah, who here is staff of some other city? I heard there were a bunch of different cities represented here. Um, that's great. Thank you guys especially for coming. Um, so <clears throat> if this works, we'll be in, uh-oh. Uh, it says it's on. It worked earlier. Yeah, I need a little support. You know, it's on when it vibrates, right? <laughs> so I started last night by mentioning that when I do this for a city, they either get the word they either get the word more or they don't. A lot of places where I, a lot of places where I work, um, I'd say half the places I go to. Yeah, it's not. Uh, it's not going. Oh, we go? there we go. Half the places I go to. Um, aren't walkable at all. And I'd say 95% or 99% of the places I go to aren't already as far along as you are. Often I forget to compliment the, the communities I go to and what they've already achieved. Um, this is a place where I go for fun. Um, the, you know, I, go, I come here to walk around. And so you've already made it so far along. But as I mentioned last night, I'm going to stop saying as I mentioned last night. But as I mentioned last night, um, you know, I can't help you if I just tell you how good you are. And there is stuff to be found that could be improved. So please don't be insulted when I say this is a problem that needs fixing. Um, but there aren't, there aren't as many here as in many places. So I just moved into this building. I moved to Brookline, Massachusetts. Do any of you know Brookline? I grew up in the Belmont area. Um, and my folks are in Lexington. And they're getting older. And they need some help. And so we moved we move back to this area. But this is the first talk I've ever driven to because Usually I'm flying in somewhere. It's nice to be convenient. But I wanted to point out this, uh, this trek. And this is the trek I make every summer, uh, several times last summer, um, because we have a cabin on, do you guys know Patuckaway Lake? So we have a cabin on Patuckaway Lake that, that I've been going to since I was seven years old. So this is our, this is our area. And, um, um, uh, but I don't know Portsmouth well at all. And it's interesting, even, as, even given how I tend to look at things as a city planner, because I can't help it, you know, when I visited here in the past, I haven't thought about what could be fixed. So my knowledge is, is limited. And as I said last night, I'll get, oops, I will, I will get something wrong today, probably several things wrong today. And you're welcome to correct me privately. <laughs> so as a city planner, I work on plans for two different kinds of things. I work on plans for existing places, like this is South Beach in Miami, where I lived for a decade. Um, and I work on plans for making new places. Um, I went to South Beach in 1993, new places. This is Kentlands, which is outside. Has anyone been to Kentlands? Outside, a few, outside of Washington, DC. So I'm also a new urbanist. What does a new urbanist mean? A new urbanist means that, that we study these older places in order to make plans for newer places, because the places that we love the most in the world are these older places. And there's a lot of rules inherent in these places. Most urban planners, at least urban designers, were trained as architects. And architecture is a very odd profession, which unlike law or medicine, um, 
puts an inordinate value on invention. And so, you know, the joke is, not the joke, the, the truth is that architects are really expected to invent a new architecture every Monday morning. That's what you're taught in school. Imagine if law did that or medicine did that, and there wasn't this idea of building new knowledge on top of old knowledge. New urbanism is really just an attempt to make architecture and urban design behave as a profession like law or medicine and saying there's stuff to be learned from older places. Does law constantly innovate? Yes. Does medicine constantly innovate? Yes, but we don't throw out the old lessons. And so that's, I think, been the new urbanist revolution, is to say, we're going to study South Beach to learn the rules to make new places, actually new places near South Beach, because new urbanism is also very regionally focused. It's an architecture of place, not an architecture of time. And what you're taught in school is that architecture must represent today. But what you learn as a new urbanist is that architecture must represent its place. And so, um, you know, to, to, to design Kentlands, of course, we didn't look at South Beach, we looked at Georgetown, because you want to find those models. And when you're working on a new neighborhood, as we do as new urbanists in the Portsmouth area, then you look at Portsmouth, because it's the best example locally of a place people go just to be there, and the real estate values re recognize that. So this is Andres and Liz, and I always like to mention them um, as my mentors, but also because half the stuff you're going to hear from me is really just stuff that, I'm, that I learned from them. And so much of my presentation is, is really other people's stuff, including Rick Chelman. Who knows Rick Chelman? He lives here. And I'll show you some traffic stuff, actually slides that he gave me in 1992. But Rick happens to be one of the leading, one, actually, the, the two, there were only two engineers in 1988 who were preaching the, what we've now learned to be true about how cars behave, how traffic behaves, and how drivers behave in terms of safety. And they were Rick Chelman and Walter Kulash. So he's a real treasure that you happen to have in your commu own community. I've certainly learned that people are valued the further, in fact, by moving to Boston, I've devalued myself to you because consultants are valued as a function of how far they've driven or flown, really how far they've flown to get to you. I have no doubt that Rick is undervalued in this community. I'm glad he's not here from, to hear me say this um, because he's local, but he's truly an international expert on the very issues that we're talking about. So this is the book that I wrote with Andres and Liz um, that got me appointed to the National Endowment for the Arts um, running the design division there, and I got to oversee this program. And I share this program with people because, first of all, your mayor should go, and um, wherever you're from, your mayor should go, um, but also because it, it's what allowed me to, to change the argument, I think, away from an urbanism discussion to a discussion that regular folks can be much more um, connected to, which is this concept of walkability. It's all really just good urban design. We've been designing places with the kind of the, the, the principal objective being walkability for many years, but we hadn't really understood it that way. We hadn't used that term. And working with these mayors at the Mayor's Institute, um, two sessions, a, a session every two months, three days we'd lock ourselves in a room and try and solve an urban design challenge in each mayor's city. Each, urban, each mayor would bring a case study. It's like the Harvard Business School. Case, you use the case study method to teach broader principles. And sometimes we solve their case studies like, where do I put my parking garage? You know, we located a parking garage in Anchorage. You know, or we helped you know, reconnect um, you know, any number of cities. What's the one I was thinking of? Um, some Dallas city to its riverfront. So some, sorry, some Texas city to its riverfront. Not, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was like a piece of Dallas. But um, really, the purpose of the case studies is to get to those broader issues. But what I learned from the experience was, in talking to all these mayors, <coughs> as opposed to talking to, to other planners, was that they, they were using walkability as the principal measure of their success as a city, at least from, a, from an urban design point of view. So more recently, I worked with this group called CEOs for Cities. And they're a group that, um, they're a nonprofit that cities pay a lot of money to. It's preposterous how, how thin the reports are compared to the cost of the report. So I shouldn't say that. But the, the reports are really important because they tell them the really key things, like how do we program, what's, it's the programming. Like how, how big should our convention center be? What sort of sports facilities should we have or not have? But the goal of every, of every city that I've visited, at least one big goal, is to attract talent, to attract corporations, to attract millennials, right? These young engines of entrepreneurship. And by the way, one thing I forgot to mention last night in talking about why cities are the place of the future, um, 
65% of millennials decide first where they want to live, and then they move there, and then they look for a job, which is completely different from my generation, where you moved for the job. And 77% of millennials polled say they want to live in America's urban cores. Because those urban cores provide a lifestyle that is different from you know, the suburban car-bound lifestyle, and in fact, an urban core that doesn't provide that walkable lifestyle isn't satisfying the criteria that the millennials are using. But in any case, CEOs for Seas understands that the programming is really important. What, what sort of events, like Art Prize and Grand Rapids, do you have that causes people to come into your city? But also, it's just the everyday design of the spaces between the buildings. Are you creating the sort of environment that people want to be in? And that's why design is such an important part of the discussion. And more and more of, of my work then has been focused on how can we make this place more attractive. So if, if walkable places are thriving places, which is the conclusion that most people now seem to share, um, the question is how do you get people to walk? Which leads to the general theory of walkability. It's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek um, phrase, but it's a lot of people's thinking over probably 30 years, um, which I've built upon, I suppose, but really this is not original work. What the general theory of walkability says, oh, and it's the, oh, I was, so don't forget to plug your book, they told me. Um, the book is for sale outside when we're done, and I'll have a book signing. I really do want you to write the book. Like any author, I wrote the book to be read. Um, and there's a ton of stuff in the book that I'm certainly not able to communicate today. You're lucky, though, because the book has no pictures, and these are all the pictures. So these pictures plus the book, and you're all, you're done. So in America, in which it's so easy to drive, and I could go on for my entire time about all the ways that you don't pay the full cost of driving. But it's been calculated that you're probably paying a third, a third to a half of the true cost of driving, which means society is bearing the remainder of those costs, which means that it's what economists call a free good. And whenever a good is a free good, it's like bread in the Soviet era. They, just, they couldn't keep the bread on the shelves because they set an arbitrary price for it that was lower than its real value, and so they could never keep up. The same thing is true of, you know, of, of parking. When parking is free, the, the, planner's, the planner's phrase is, um, of course there's not enough parking. If pizza were free, would there be enough pizza? And so driving is not free, but you don't pay the full cost. So there's always an incentive to drive. And if you own a car, it's, it's the easiest thing to, to, it's amazing for us. So we lived in Washington, we had our car in front of our house. And we would, wouldn't think about, even, even with my preaching, we wouldn't think about hopping in it to go to places. We moved to Brookline, and we have to park the car five minutes away, and we hardly use it at all. Because now it's just not there between us and everything. So in this circumstance where driving is so attractive, if you're going to get people to walk, then the walk has to be as good as the drive or better. So that means it has to satisfy four criteria simultaneously. And there may be others, but these are the main. In fact, every time I talk, someone says, you forgot X. But these are the main ones. And no one's convinced me yet to add any new ones. Um, that the walk has to be useful, safe, comfortable, and interesting. So I'm going to take, this is the structure of my talk today. It's the structure of the book. Um, and uh, we're going to go through this, these one by one. So the reason to walk is the, um, you know, it's the difference between downtown Portsmouth and, and and peas, right? Not the vegetable. But these two different models, these two different models of development. And the history of planning in this country was this outgrowth of the formative victory of the planning profession. You know, the, the victory that created the planning profession when people were choking from the soot of the dark satanic mills in, in Europe and elsewhere. And the planners said, hey, let's move the housing away from the mills, and lifespans increased immediately and dramatically. And you know, Andre Stuani's joke is you know, the planners have been trying to relive that victory. You know, the planners were hailed as heroes, and they've been trying to relive that victory ever since. So the onset of Euclidean zoning and this assumption that we're going to begin the planning process on any site by separating the land into these massive areas of single use, in which single family housing isn't allowed to touch multifamily housing in which office isn't allowed to touch medical office. I mean, many zoning codes have hundreds of categories. George Proakis from Somerville, who'd be a great guy for you to bring to speak next, um, from Somerville, Mass., 
he, he showed a code that had like 240 different, 240 different um, uh, categories, including like baths, comma, Turkish, and Turkish baths that you had to separate from each other. And, and of course, you know, we all know this is wrong, the planners in the room, we all know this is wrong, but how much of the land in your community is currently zoned this way? I know that most places I go when I land, you know, and I'm taken to a site, this is a site that you need to, that you need to plan, there's already a map like this on the land that needs to be thrown out. And these, these have not been thrown out yet. So the fact that there's only one road connecting everything and no requirement for intersection density, which gives you a block structure, and the fact that each of these areas is, is single use and large means that actually you will never, you will never achieve walkability with a, this is your foundation. So I was an art history major, which they say isn't worth much, but I can say you don't want a Rothko, you want a Seurat. Seurat was the pointillist. And the more fine grain, the more confetti-like your zoning is, the more walkable a place is going to be. And this map is even misleading, because look, the, some, the, the, the um, medi medium red color, mixed commercial residential buildings, is so much of this. So a lot of this is vertically integrated and isn't even single use on its site. Now, I should interrupt myself to say, a lot of what I'm going to be telling you today, you already know and you're already doing, but, don't, but not all of it. So, so don't say, oh, we already know that here. Say, okay, I'm going to wait for the next thing that I don't know. Because I know that you know this here. I know that you're, and, I'm, and I should say you're ahead of many places. You hired a very good firm, <coughs> uh, TPUDC, with a horrible name, TPUDC, to do your um, north side plan. You've already got form-based coding uh, in your process. And so, you know, you're well along here but it's just something to remember that's super important. <coughs> so now here's, let's, let's briefly return to the fundamentals. And this is the argument that we made in Suburban Nation. It's the principal new urbanist argument, which is that there are only two ways to make community in the world. Well, sorry, two tested ways. There's a thousand ways to make a city, but in terms of stuff that's been done by the thousands and tested by the thousands, and we can kick the tires and see how it functions, there are only two ways, the traditional neighborhood and, and suburban sprawl. This is, New, this is Newburyport. You guys know Newburyport. I could just as easily have a slide here of Portsmouth and it would show the same things. That in, the, in a traditional neighborhood, it's, it's actually defined in planning terminology as being diverse, um, walkable, and compact. The traditional neighborhood throughout history and throughout every culture is almost always somewhere around a five minute walk from its edge to its center. Um, if you look at you know, a place that we both know like Manhattan, and you look at Tribeca, and the East Village, and the West Village, and all these different areas that are known as neighborhoods, they all correspond fairly closely to that measure. Sprawl, of course, is the opposite, as the name implies. This is actually several different neighborhoods of Newburyport. It's diverse in the sense, and not in the way that it's commonly used, but it's from a planning, from a use perspective, it's diverse in, this, in, in, in that you have places to live, places to work, places to worship, places to shop, places to recreate. Most of your daily needs, certainly not all of them, most of your daily needs are in walking distance. And, you know, I took the car to come up here and left my wife with no car in Brookline for two days, and she was like, no problem, because we live in a traditional neighborhood, just like this is a traditional neighborhood. Um, and it's walkable in the sense that, it, it principally because there are many streets and so no one street has to become very large. Here you can see that uh, it's not diverse. You know, whole square miles often hold only one use or one house over and over and over again. And of course you have to go to the Sun Belt or to areas which have seen most of their development more recently to find this sort of, a, you know, this sort of pure experience of repetition. The, the important thing to understand is that in most communities, even older communities like Portsmouth, this is the model that the entire development community has been accustomed to building. Not this big, but when they get a piece of, you know, the whole infrastructure of, you know, you've got developers who build office parks, and that's all they do. You've got developers who build multifamily housing, and that's all they do. Developers who build single family, 
et cetera. And then you have a whole industry of, of lending, which packages these things by the hundreds and by the thousands. And there's this whole infrastructure now in place that makes it natural. This is the, this is the, this is the apotheosis of the codes in most places now, even places that look like this. So you have to dismantle this process, actually. And then finally, um, the reason why this is, there's many reasons why this isn't walkable. And I think as I, as I talk about walkability today, you'll understand how this fails to satisfy every criteria. But um, so few of the streets actually connect, right? So few of the streets actually get you anywhere that the streets that do get you somewhere have to be supersized, right? It's, it's what's called a dendritic system, a branching system, or a sparse hierarchy. And the sparse hierarchy is from highway to arterial to collector to local to parking lot or, you know, cul-de-sac. And it means that those streets that do get you somewhere are, are, are built around a sole criteria. You know, streets in America used to be, well, many streets still, look at the streets of, of Portsmouth. What do they do? They're places to drive. They're places to walk. They're places to bike. They're, place, they're, they're an urban forest, if you've handled it correctly. There are places to enter and exit businesses, front doors for homes, places to sit and dine, perhaps. Look, this isn't even a front door, because it's so noxious that the houses turn their back on it. And so this is what we call traffic sewers, which sounds like a funny insult, but, but it's not meant as a joke. I mean, it's, 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 it functions entirely like a sewer. It's sized to handle as much volume as possible at, the, at a reasonable cost, and there's no other criteria Safety is theoretically a criteria, but it's really not if you look at how these function. So it's a different model. So here's where we have our fun, and we look at these apocryphal slides that the aerial photographer Alex McLean took, where we break sprawl into its constituent parts. What's amazing about sprawl? Is that a real photo? Oh, yeah. These are all real photos. Um, and, and this is, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Not only is this, is this preposterous in the sense that it's isolated, in the sense that it's one, one use and only one use. But if you look at the details, it's actually really bad in so many ways. You have blocks that have like, um, uh, you know, there are a lot of half blocks in here where you have houses facing, you know, the fronts of housing, fa houses facing the rear of houses. There's so many things wrong with this image. But the main point of this series is that, you know, it's very easy to classify sprawl into those places where you only live, where you only work. This is in Silicon Valley. Um, we only shop. And, and the fact that there's this, been this trend nationally, and I had to fight this in Lowell, Mass, actually, um, for the school to, to, move, to, get, to move to the edge of town and the supersizing of our schools um, for the pride of the school board or maybe the convenience of the janitor, who knows why. But as schools get bigger and bigger and bigger, no one thinks about how they get further and further and further away. And how, you know, when I was a kid, 15% of us Walk, sorry, when I was a kid, 50% of us walked or biked to school, and now 13% of American kids walk, walk or bike to school. I talked a lot about Portland last night and Portland, Oregon, and all the things they've done. A decade ago in Portland, 10% of the kids walked or biked to school. Now, 43% of the kids walk or bike to school because of a focus on keeping the school small, having it be neighborhood-based, and the, the pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure that's been introduced. That's an astounding number. Um, but anyway, you can see the size of the parking lot compared to the size of the school tells you all you need to know, which is that no, one, no one's even taking buses to this school. The houses are so far flung that everyone's driving, and the older kids are driving the younger kids with the car crashes to prove it. And then also the supersizing of sports facilities. So when I was in Lowell, Mass., I'll be showing you pictures of Lowell, um, there, there is still a move afoot and still a, an active argument in the media about whether we should move the high school from the heart of downtown where half the kids are taking like city buses to get to high school, it's a miracle, to the edge of town to make a span sparkling brand new facility, which to me is a preposterous discussion. And then here, um, you know, the idea that we have this extremely large recreational area that we're very proud of with its eight soccer fields and eight baseball diamonds and all of that, but because it's so big, of course, it's far away. But then the other aspect of the sprawl model is that it's at the end of the long collector road. And no mom or dad is going to let their kid alone, unsupervised, bicycle down that road, which is a, quite a dangerous road. And um, this is why we have the soccer mom in America. You know, when I was a kid, I had access to one soccer field, you know, two tennis courts, but it was in my neighborhood. No one had to take me there. 
So the two models, the two great models that, that either contributed to the creation of sprawl or just were prescient in their understanding of, of sprawl were uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's Broadacre City, which is basically, you know, what led to the American version, and then Le Corbusier's um, plan voisin, Le Corbusier's uh, Ville Radieuse. Did I get that right? Yeah. Ville Radieuse, which was the tower in the park, you know, where he basically replaced the historic city with these cruciform shaped towers that were all identical through the landscape, which led to tower in the park urbanism, which in America, you know, became the tower in the parking lot, which was the model for so much, um, you know, federally funded housing in the 1960s and many of the projects that we know, like the Cabrini, Cabrini Greens that were torn down. But what, what neither of them did properly, particularly Frank Lloyd Wright with Broadacre City, was to count the cars. If you separate everything from everything else and reconnect it only with automotive infrastructure, then everyone's burdened with this cost of, of driving everywhere. Frank Lloyd Wright had the people in little helicopters, these personal, everyone had personal helicopters zipping around. But he still didn't count how many helicopters you would have needed. So, I always say, tell people it's a two-part deal. You know, for many people, although fewer and fewer every year, for many people this is the American dream, but one comes with the other. And our federal highway system, which was created for commerce and created for, you know, for vacation travel, has become a commuting way. And I've lived, I lived in three different places on the East Coast where I-95 was my way to work because of the system that we've created. So sometimes it gets a little preposterous. This is, I believe, in Medford, Massachusetts. Um, this is not Photoshop. Um, but there's a larger discussion to be had about you know, what we invest in as a society. And if we're so gold-plating our, our horizontal infrastructure so that you never have to wait more than a single cycle at, a single, at any light, then we rob our public coffers. The problem is, is that it's two different sets of coffers. You know, the money that we're using to build beautiful city halls and churches and schools comes from a different fund than the money we use to build highways. And somehow the federal government and the state government, maybe not in, in, in New Hampshire, but the state governments as well as federal governments tend to subsidize the construction of the roadways but not of the, the vertical infrastructure. And if we, if, we, if we made our roads more reasonably, we'd have a lot more money, even though it's a different kitty. We'd have a lot more money left over to make beautiful civic buildings like we used to. Um, being in these places can be very, dis very um, frustrating. This is not Photoshop. Um, driving can be bad. <laughs> And walking, walking can be worse. And um, the epidemiologists have been talking, you know, the, 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 one of the key voices, one of the key voices now, and actually sources of funding for making places more walkable, has been the epidemiologists and the doctors who are now saying that the big, one of the biggest threats to the health, perhaps the, some are saying, like Dick Jackson, are saying the greatest threat to the vitality of our nation is suburban sprawl because we actually have, you know, and we do have the first generation of kids in America ever who are expected to live shorter lives than their parents. And one third of all kids born since 2000 are expected to be, by the CDC, are expected to become diabetic because of the idea that you, you, know, you drive to the parking lot to take the escalator to the gym to get on the treadmill to walk. And that it's that, it, you know, convincing people to become athletes or weekend warriors, you know, to run triathlons or just to, to work out more, has not succeeded, does not succeed in improving the health of, the, of, of a community because people just don't stick to it. But what they do stick to is an environment in which walking is useful to them. So making our walks more useful is key to the health of our country. So these are the two models. And, you know, you have both, right? But on the left is the sprawl model. And the, the, the importance of this slide is to acknowledge that it's all, it's all the same stuff. It's just a matter of scale and interspersion. And then whether you have a network, whether you have a street network or not. And the, the, the great irony of the sprawl model is that it was, you know, it was unlike the traditional neighborhood, which developed naturally in response to man's needs, the, the sprawl model was an invention. And it was invented around the, the, the presumption and the celebration of one car per citizen. And the great irony is that it, it actually functions worse, not just for walking, but for cars. Because in this dendritic system, in which there's only one street that connects everything to everything else, then if there's a, you know, one engine fire on that street, then the whole system just shuts down. 
And of course, if there's a, and the, the, the deputy chief can back me up here, um, you know, this is hell for a fire department because you need, you know, there's only one path to the fire. And so many of our fire codes, like the universal fire code, were now written, have been written with the presumption of sprawl. So for example, in a lot of communities, you need 20 foot clear on every street because of, on a cul-de-sac, you need to be able to park one truck and get another truck by it because there's only one way in and out. Right? So many of our rules have been written around the presumption of sprawl. Whereas in a traditional neighborhood with a network, there's 10 paths to every fire and 10 paths to every destination. So if you're here and you need to get over there, and there's a problem here, you know, or a problem there or there, it's still easy to get around. And this is why sprawl can never really grow. It doesn't have the street network to grow taller and bigger and more robust because the minute you get any real density in there, it's, it's choked up. So <coughs> those are the two models. And you know, your downtown is a beautiful example of the former. And, frankly, and most of your neighborhoods, you have a lot of pre-war neighborhoods. Most of your neighborhoods are pre-war neighborhoods. And they also correspond to the, at least to the, to the networked model if they're not mixed use. And then the, the model that's currently in place on the, on the undeveloped land. So when you're talking about a downtown then, um, let me see where I'm going here. Yeah, when you're looking at a downtown area, and, and I should step back to say that most of the time, and I know this is, this is limiting, but most of the time when I'm working in communities, I do end up talking about the downtowns because the downtowns are the place where there's the greatest opportunity for walkability because there's already mixed use and particularly there's already commercial use. It's much, much easier to bring more housing to a commercial area than to bring more commercial to a housing area. And if you don't believe me, go into one of your residential neighborhoods, tear down a house and try putting in a 7-Eleven, right, and see what happens. So the greatest opportunity in most communities for walkability are those older mixed-use neighborhoods, the principal, the principal one of which is your downtown. And when you look at a downtown in a community, you ask this question first, what is missing or, or underrepresented? And in most American cities, it is housing. And I think if you were to look at the ratio of workplace to housing in your downtown, particularly the heart of your downtown, you would, you would see a mismatch. I was working in Boise. Boise has a ratio of 43 to 1 of workplace to housing in the downtown. You're nowhere near there. But the idea is that if you want to make the downtown more walkable, you can achieve a better balance of uses probably. Does anyone know the ratio here? There's certainly opportunity for more housing downtown. Now here, of course, you're limited, tremendously limited by the amount of land you have and the historic buildings you have. Um, but there's certainly, as we've seen, there's certainly a push to bring more housing downtown. And I think it's a wise, a wise push. And as you get more housing downtown, the other things tend to kick in in better measure. Different question. What is underpriced and overrepresented? Now, I think I've been, become convinced that parking is not overrepresented in Portsmouth. I, I might, you know, we might need a little more data to, con to confirm that. Most American cities, they have enough parking, but the parking's managed in such a way that people think there's a shortage. And what it really is is an unwillingness of people to go a little bit further afield and park a you know, three-minute walk away from their destination. I'm pretty convinced that actually you, you are, have reached a ceiling in terms of you're filling your parking. I'm not sure if that's the case in your residential neighborhoods. And you know, most cities like yours, here's why I might make some enemies, most cities like yours as the downtown fills up, people start to park on the residential streets that surround the downtown. And that is sometimes, a, typically, at least as it begins, it's a bone of contention. There are techniques that are available to make that a much less inconvenient thing for residents. In my neighborhood in Washington, D.C., we were having a problem because folks were parking in our neighborhood and taking up our on-street parking. And all our parking, we didn't have driveways, all our parking was on-street parking. We instituted a permit system and basically solved the problem. So I do, I do have the question that you might want to investigate as to whether a permit system might allow you to take advantage of a cache of underutilized parking spaces that exist in your residential neighborhoods around the downtown. 
But I don't know much about it. I don't want to presume anything, and I could be wrong. But I just want to raise the specter of that. In most downtowns, there's an excess of parking, but it's, it's not understood because it's not priced properly. You guys know this man, some of you. His name is Don Shoup. And he wrote this great book called The High Cost of Free Parking. And it's um, 723 pages and three and a half pounds. And people don't read it because it's big and heavy. I had jury duty, so I read it. <laughs> and, um, and it's an amazing book. And I quote heavily in my book. And actually, I turned the whole book into one chapter of my book with his blessing and his edit. And now I can tell you, you don't need to buy his book. <laughs> but you should. You should, because I just, I just skimmed the surface. You guys have already started to use, with some resistance, to use his principles in your downtown, which is, to, which is basically it's a three-legged stool. Don Shoup, you know, parking is the single highest land use, the single greatest land use in the typical American city. And for years, we've been managing parking by asking the wrong question, which is how can we have enough? And Don Shoup says the, the question we should be asking is, how can we manage parking? How can we provide and manage and price parking in a way that cities thrive? Which is the question we should ask. And he's been studying it for his whole career. He's not young. <laughs> and he's come up with this three-legged stool that I think your leadership here understands, that the public doesn't fully understand, and I'm certain the public is resistant to. The three-legged stool is first, um, basically to eliminate the on-site parking requirement in those areas where walkability is, is possible. This is what the on-site parking requirement does. This is an opera house in Detroit, ironically on the site of where um, Henry Ford invented his, his car. But on-site parking requirements are destructive to the landscape. And it's easy to point out the, all the buildings around America that on-site parking has caused to come down. But what Don Shoup points out is all of the things that fail to happen because of the on-site parking requirement. You know, the, the piano store that goes out of business and someone wants to turn it into a, um, a, you know, a restaurant, but the restaurant's requirement of seats per square foot, requirement of parking spaces per square foot is so much higher than the piano store that they can't turn into the restaurant without providing parking and there's no room for the parking, so they have to tear down half the building. Or, but what really happens is they just never turn it into the restaurant. So I believe you've eliminated your downtown parking requirement for commercial. Is that correct? And you're providing, and so it, it isn't. It, the, the answer isn't to remove your parking requirements, but it's to provide parking. It's to, it's to remove your on-site parking requirement, and then to provide parking collectively. And so what you've already done with your one big lot, and with the other lot that you're considering building, and the other things that scatter around the downtown, the other parking lots around the downtown, is to understand that if you want to have a walkable downtown. Everyone can't be parking right in front of their destination. Or A, that, A, there'll be no reason to walk. And B, all these parking lots will ruin the landscape in such a way that no one wants, wants to walk. So that's the first step. The second step, which is why I say you're, you're figuring it out, is to price parking in a response to, the, to, the, to, the de, to demand. Demand-based pricing. And this is the communication, then, that you need to have with your public, which is that parking is a is a good, a public good, that will operate spastically if it's not priced in relationship to its value. Like they couldn't keep the bread on the shelves in Russia. So if parking does not cost what it's worth to people, then the market cannot function properly and people make bad decisions, which lead to things like endless circling, Right. Don Shoup documented how in Westwood, California, 95% of the traffic at 1 p.m. was, or 12, 12 p.m. was people circling to find a parking spot. 95% of the traffic. And even in light in places like New York City, it's so much cheaper to park on the street, double park on the street, risk getting a ticket, than to park in a lot, which is like 20 bucks an hour, that people make really bad decisions that gum up, gum up the streets. So. I think what you've started to do in your downtown, you need to do more comprehensively and more systematically, is to recognize that around, that in different locations, but also at different times, parking has different value. Now, you don't need to do what they did in San Francisco and put a sensor in every spot and have a computer, a site that you should visit online called SF Park, 
or on your phone where you can figure out the cost and the availability of parking everywhere in the city and it's varying from 25 cents an hour to 650 an hour based on the demand at that given time. You don't need to go that far. But what you do need to do is understand how different parts of your downtown have different value, but also to be honest and, and to communicate with the public that, that yes, you know, if it's, if it's crowded on Sunday, then you need to charge for parking on Sunday. If, it's, if people are dining after 7 p.m. in your downtown, then you need to charge for parking after 7 p.m. in your downtown. If you don't, then the downtown doesn't function properly. It's simply equating price with value so that the market can function. And what happens, this isn't as discriminatory to, to anybody. If you have more money, you park closer in and you pay more. If you have less money, you park further out and you, you, you walk more. And that's how people operate in every other aspect of American society. But somehow people feel that parking is this right. I like to say parking is not a right. Parking is, free parking is not a right. Um, parking is also not a, um, should not be understood by the city as a revenue generator. Now, if you price it right, you will generate a ton of revenue. But you can't approach as a revenue generator because that makes you make, again, bad decisions. You've got to price it in relationship to the market. So the first, the first leg of the stool is, is to eliminate the on-site parking requirement. The second is to price it according to the market. And the third is, you know, what do we do with all this money now that we're pricing the parking in certain places more? Um, and that's what's called the parking benefit district. And this is in Pasadena, where there was tremendous resistance to Don Shoup's plan to raise the price of parking because there was no parking available. Oh, and I should say, the, the, the target amount is 85% occupancy, which basically means one empty space per block face at all times. And that's a simple measure. In any place of your downtown, in your downtown at any given time, do you have that one space available? I like to say, so Daddy Warbucks can find a place near the furrier. Because the big spenders have the least time and the least willingness to walk distances. And so if you want your downtown to, to thrive even more, which is a question I raised last night, maybe you don't. Maybe you're afraid of the chains. Maybe your rents are already, maybe your downtown's already too successful. And in, in which case, you have to be worried about making it better. But I, I want to ask that question and leave it hanging there so you can think about it, because that's not what I'm here to do. What I'm here is to tell you how to make your downtown better. But I do want to raise the issue that maybe you don't want your downtown to be better. It's not just a rhetorical question. But if you want your downtown and your businesses to do better, then you want to have 15% vacancy on all your curbs. And you want to charge enough to do that. That's going to make you more money. And the, 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 the retailers typically don't understand the, the economics of parking and will fight against raising the price of parking. And certainly the residents will, too. And Don Shoup tells these wonderful stories how community after community, the very same retailers who fought against pricing parking higher, the next day came up to him and said, thank you for defeating us. You were right. We were wrong. But because they're so hard to convince, the, the parking benefits district, which is also the right thing to do, takes all the extra money you earn by charging more for parking and pours it into the streets and the trees and the sidewalks and the facades even of the buildings in the, in the area where the people are parking. And so that makes it better. It, is, it starts this virtual cycle, virtuous, virtuous cycle, where the place gets better and better, the parking gets more and more valued, they charge more and more money for it. So these are the former alleys of Pasadena, which is now this tremendous pedestrian network that was paid for by the price of parking. So this doesn't mean that you need to change the price every hour or every day. You want it to be a system that people can remember. But having a daytime price and a nighttime and weekend price, making sure the hours are extended to, to equal the hours when there's crowding, and to be a little more precise in the pricing so that you achieve that vacancy is a, a wise path to take. Okay. <clears throat> I also have a whole segment on transit. I'm not going to talk about transit just because I don't have time. Um, but I do think that um, uh, you know, tr I, I think that you actually have more, more transit here than I expected to see. I saw a lot of buses. And I think that it's, it's very important not, not to neglect the value that transit plays in allowing you to make your city walkable. Because every, you know, every transit trip begins or ends as a walk. And uh, actually, it's, a, it's kind of a, it works both ways. Transit agencies 
Well, this is interesting. Transit agencies sometimes make demands that undermine walkability. Like, okay, we need 11 foot lanes for our buses. Or, you know, this turning radius needs to be gigantic for our buses. And you have to be careful of those, of those demands because they can undermine the very ridership that the trade transit agency hopes to have by creating an environment in which no one wants to walk. But I like to say that you can have a walkable neighborhood. You can have a perfectly walkable neighborhood without good transit. But walkable cities really rely on transit because if you can't get to the different walkable parts of your city on transit, then you buy a car if you can afford one. And if you buy a car, then the city tends to reshape itself around your car and everyone else's car, and it undermines the qualities that make the city walkable. So transit is super important. And of course, it's most important as a conveyance of those people who can't drive, can't afford to drive, or they're physically not able to drive. Um, and it's so important that those people um, have the option to live somewhere affordably, which can be connected by transit to the downtown. So the safe walk is the big category. Uh, it's about 100 different moving parts. Half the cities I work in get half of them wrong. You guys are doing better than almost any. The first is block size. This is Portland, Oregon, famously walkable, famously 200 foot blocks. This is Salt Lake City, famously unwalkable, famously 600 foot, well, not so famously, 600 foot blocks. Here they are side by side. You can put about nine Portland blocks in a Salt Lake City block. And the point here is that a 200 foot block city is, can be, and often is, principally a two lane city. Portland has some wider streets, but most of the streets are two lanes, even in this dense, busy, tall downtown. And Salt Lake City, because the blocks are so big, the typical street, you know, 600 foot block city is a six lane city, which is why, no kidding, in certain places in Salt Lake City, they give you a flag to carry when you cross the street, because they're so wide and so fast. These are the statistics from 24 different California cities. Um, when you double the average size of the block, you almost quadruple the number of fatal accidents on non-highway streets. So there's a clear correlation. Um, your blocks are really nice and small, particularly in your historic downtown. Any older neighborhood you have is also going to have pretty nice sized blocks. It's hard to see, so here's the, here's the um, map version. And you can see that a lot of your blocks are 200 feet, at least on one side, not that long. The longer blocks are probably places where walking is a little bit less happening a little bit less. And of course, the area with the most intricate block network is the most walked area. And then you look at this area where, you know, this area, like what, there aren't even blocks really, right? Because so many of the streets are just branches. But here they are side by side. And what's astounding in this comparison isn't just the size of the blocks, but think about, you know, just think about all the stuff that happens here. This, the entire heart of your downtown fits in this tiny bit of peace. So the, the degree of waste of space that this represents is, is astronomical. Um, but anyway, the, the, key, the, the key lesson here, because obviously you're, you, you know, you're born with a certain bone structure, the key lesson here that most cities need to understand, even if they're very walkable like you, is to beware uh, efforts to consolidate, to superblock. Very often universities or hospitals are trying to remove streets to make connections between their facilities uh, more direct. It's also a little bit of a warning against pedestrian streets. And people ask me, should we, should we have more pedestrian malls? And that's, or should we put a mall, is it Market Street? People are considering a ped mall on Market Street. And you know, there are places for ped malls it's a longer discussion to be had. You know, 180 of the 170 to 180 of the 200 ped malls that were created in this country failed almost immediately. You've got one that's doing pretty badly already. Um, there's a big reason for that. And the, the answer isn't to not do pedestrian malls, but to test them very carefully and very cheaply over time. You know, close it for a festival, which you've already done, then close it for a whole weekend, close it for a week, see how it functions because most stores in America rely on people driving by them. It's not like Europe. But there are exceptions, and you may be an exception. But the, the thing to worry about with pedestrian malls is that they limit the porousness of your street network. So they limit the choices, and they cause traffic to, to become greater on all those other streets. So there is a, there is a, a concern there. Um, but my basic point is, you know, don't do anything to undermine your lovely bones, 
which you have. Then there's a number of lanes. So here's the conversation I have in every community I go to, because it's a conversation that has to be had in every single American community. It pertains to highways, and it pertains to city streets as well. Um, and it's the concept of induced, induced demand. These are a couple slides I got from Rick Chelman in the 90s. So this is what people think, how people think traffic planning, well, how people think traffic functions. This is what traffic planning believes is how traffic functions, which is that when the tra number of travelers exceeds the capacity of the road, this difference is congestion. And then if you widen the road, you absorb the forecast. Now, the first thing to say, which I didn't say last night, is that all the forecasts have now turned out to be wrong. Maybe you've been following this in the news. You know, states and cities and federally, we've been pr projecting how much people are going to drive. And every model you ever look at, it looks like this. And in fact, what we've seen is, year after year, the projections keep showing that it's going up. And it really flattened around, uh, nine, around 2006. VMT, vehicle miles traveled, in most, in most states, flattened. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. People thought it was economic because of the housing uh, bubble bursting. But it's, it's actually social. And it's not going to change. And most people who study this, scientists who study this, say that actually vehicle miles traveled has peaked and will essentially stay level or drop. So the idea that most traffic models tell you that you have to create more roads or more lanes to absorb future traffic may just be wrong to start with. But secondly, <coughs> the models are correct in the sense that when they predict higher volumes and they provide for higher volumes, they get higher volumes because of induced demand. And this is what happens. This is what induced demand tells us is that in this condition, particularly in this condition, there were a lot of trips that just weren't happening. And a lot of decisions that people were making because of the congestion. So they were choosing to commute a little bit off peak. They were choosing to buy or build a house somewhere further away from their job. They were choosing not to carpool. They were choosing not to bicycle, not to take transit. They were making these choices based on the congestion. And when you remove the congestion, it was then much easier for them and cheaper for them to make the choice to drive exactly at during rush hour in a car by themselves and not get around any other way. The operative phrase here is that in congested systems, the principal constraint to driving is congestion. The underlying economics is that driving is a free good, as we discuss. It's what economists call a free good. If driving weren't a free good, this would not be the case. But because driving is something you don't pay the full cost of, it makes sense to drive as much as possible. So, um, as you increase the, abil the ability of lanes, people take them up again and again. Today's engineers acknowledge that building new roads usually makes traffic worse. And the experience I've had in many cities is engineers who don't acknowledge that. I know here the traffic engineers do get it. The Public Works Department gets it. But believe it or not, your citizens probably don't get it. Most Americans don't understand this. And even in places where the Public Works Department gets it, the principal complaints they're getting from citizens is about congestion. And the principal remedy that citizens are recommending is to remove a lane of parking, to put in a new lane of driving, or to build a new lane on the road, or to widen the highway. And certainly you know at the state level and at the federal level, that's what's still happening. And people in Congress are still saying, we need more roads to fight congestion. So people don't understand it. Citizens don't understand it, and politicians who at least at the federal level, are dumber than citizens, certainly don't understand it. So a place, number of places I've worked, the, um, you know, the traffic engineer said, we need, I, I worked on a project in, in New Mexico where this happened. I worked on a project in, in, um, in Wisconsin where this happened, where we had a two-laner through the middle of our project, and, and it, it was connecting suburban land to farmland. And they said, you've got to make it a, a four-laner because the trips are coming. And we made it a four-laner because we had to, and of course the trips came, because it opened up all that development and um, made it easy to drive. So here's the, here's the official economic study that was presented at the Paris School of Economics. Um, I have no idea what this means. I know what this means, which is that all the data shows, you know, across the country and around the world, that as you create new capacity, within four years, it's 100% absorbed by new trips. 
Now, if we were a command and control economy and we could stop developers from building new subdivisions or do other things that never happens in America, then this wouldn't happen. But it's, it, is, it is what happens. So metro areas that invested heavily in roads. Now, this is looking na nationwide, and this is, from around, this is from around 2000, the year 2000, that you compared like the Nashvilles and the Kansas cities and the other cities that were spending more per capita on highway expansion to the cities like Boston and Chicago and San Francisco that weren't. And what they found was that all they gained by spending extra money on roads was longer commutes. And in fact, people spent longer in traffic than they had before. So there are certain parts of your, there are certain congested parts of your downtown where, and I don't know well enough to say this with any confidence, but I'm sure there are certain parts, there are certain parts of your downtown where the induced demand discussion is, is functioning, is what's happening. I think a street like State Street which is such an important thoroughfare, the traffic will increase as you provide more room for it. So just beware of that. I love, I love the fact that in your city and other historic cities, there seems to be such a respect for the existing road, the existing, you know, man, the existing, the existing built environment, that there isn't this pressure you find in other younger cities to change it. But just the, the, the key lesson here is, you know, don't think well, at some point someone said, we have to turn a parking lane into a driving lane because we want traffic to flow more smoothly. But you've got to stop making those decisions because I think on, on the streets that are congested, you're just inviting more drivers. But the, the nice thing is, and this is much more the case in, in Midwestern cities and Southern cities, less so in New England where all your streets are, are typically nice and skinny. But every place I go does have a bunch of streets that do have some extra lanes that don't function according to the induced demand argument. Chapel Street in this location has a lane that I'm certain is not needed. If you count the number of trips per day, someone decided at some point that we need a, you know, a right-hand turn lane. And by the way, right-hand turn lanes just aren't being done anymore. Left-hand turn lanes provide a real function, which you can imagine, uh, when you have oncoming traffic in the way of the car in front of you that's trying to go left. All a right-hand turn lane does is really speed traffic up, and they're very bad for pedestrians. But in any case, wouldn't this be a much nicer street with parallel parking on it? Or maybe a bike lane on it? How you use that space is a longer discussion. But here's one of your streets, and I imagine there are others, though not very many, because this is old-time New England. But I imagine you have a few streets that simply have extra lanes. So now we're moving beyond the induced demand uh, discussion and just saying, if you want a place to be as walkable as possible, then find the, do an inventory, find those extra lanes, even if they're just a block long, and, and get rid of them. Then there's left-hand turn lanes, which are deadly and necessary, but you can't let them be any longer than they need to be. This is a block in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where, where that left-hand turn serves a street with seven houses on it that doesn't really connect to anything important. And because it's a state route, because it's a PennDOT street, we have a 300-foot left-hand turn lane, which has done what? It's put all of these businesses out of business because no one can park in front of their stores anymore. So left-hand turn lanes, if they're too long or if they're placed unnecessarily, can be extremely destructive. Of course, they also make the street wider. They make it harder to cross. They encourage cars to go more, more quickly. You've got a number of streets that do, that, do they need left-hand turn lanes? Well. The induced argument, the, the induced demand argument actually tells us that nothing needs anything, right? The people will adjust their behavior, whatever width the street is. But presuming that you want to keep traffic, the traffic equals vitality, you know, and slow moving traffic does equal vitality, and you want to keep the city functioning pretty much as it's functioning now, you've got a, a number of streets that have 11,000 cars per day. Question? Do I, do I press it down or is it? I think it's better to wait only because I've got a lot to cover. But you have a number of streets that are handling 11,000 cars per day, a few. Now, we know that a two-laner can handle 10,000 cars per day. A three-laner, statistically, I could show you a chart of 18 different three-laners that are all handling 15 to 22,000 cars per day. When you add that center turn lane, you add tremendous capacity to a street. So center turn lanes are very valuable. But when you make them too long, you know, if this, if this lane were to stay but were to be properly sized, 
you would have parking all along this curve. So let's make sure our left-hand turn lanes aren't too long. One-way streets is, oh, and as you convert one-way streets to two-way streets, the traffic engineers will tell you correctly, to maintain the same amount of flow, we've got to have left-hand turn lanes everywhere. And just be aware of that. Keep them small and put them where they're, put them where they're really needed, but they shouldn't be the knee-jerk response to every intersection. You study each intersection, put them where the, and by the way, there's a left-hand turn lane right now on Congress that is so long it removes a whole block of parking from a street that's struggling from a lack of parking. So you've already got an example in your one-way system of an extra turn lane that's really hurt the vitality of a whole block of, of Congress Street. One-way streets are, and this is why I asked the question, do you want your downtown to become better? Because if you do, then you want to do now what 100 different downtowns have done around America, maybe 200, it's happening every day, and convert the one-way system to to back to two-way, back, back. It's a rever It's not a conversion, it's a reversion. Bring it back to what it was, which was two-way traffic. The main reason why multi-lane one-way streets are not good for pedestrians is because of the opportunity for drivers to jockey, to jockey. When you have the opportunity to jockey, you become a different kind of driver. You imagine your own experience as a driver. Think about yourself on a street with only one lane, and yourself on a street with multiple lanes. And if you're like me, and I think in some ways I'm kind of normal, <laughs> and this is one of them, I always want to be in the faster lane, and I'm always in the slower lane, God damn it, right? <laughs> and so, so um, it's the behavior of the driver that's the most important thing, but obviously the sheer momentum of all these cars going in the same direction, the fact there's no opposing traffic that causes cars to drive more cautiously, the fact that on State Street, you step, you step out into the street to cross it, and um, uh, the first car stops and you can't really see the second car that's behind the first car and they can't really see you. There's a number of reasons why these aren't that safe. But the main argument, the main arguments for reverting two-way, for reverting one-way back to two-way are economic. That a number of downtowns like, like Vancouver, um, Washington, in America, Vancouver, Washington, um, really struggled with Main streets that were, the, if you read the articles, this article in Governing Magazine, I love it when it's not a planning magazine, but a you know, governing magazine, said that this town struggled and struggled with a, a, an, an unsuccessful main street. And they tried all the expensive fixes of the 80s. I like to say the, the six Bs, the bricks, the berms, the bannards, the bollards, the balloons, the bandstands, and nothing helped. But one day they reverted back to two-way traffic and their, rev their, their revenues doubled. And a lot of communities are finding this. Of course, what happened originally when the two-way streets became one-way was the opposite. East Broad Street and Savannah, one of very few streets that have been studied. There's a new study of S Louisville that's mind-blowing in terms of the, the streets that were reverted back to two-way versus the streets that, that, that stayed one-way. But the, the study that I have in my book is from Savannah. East Broad Street was converted in 69. And 64% of the tax-paying businesses on that street just went away when it went from a two-lane street, you know, a two-way street to a one-way highway. Right? It's effectively what happened. But they converted it back in 1990, and there's already been a 50% gain. Or when this study was done, maybe 10 years later, there'd been a 50% gain in businesses. There's a lot of reasons for this. I think a lot of it has to do with the attitude of the drivers, whether they're a, a driver who might shop or a road racer jockeying for a lane. But also think about this, when you go down a street, a one-way street, through an intersection, you, these, if it's a one-way street going this way, none of these stores are ever seen by a car. Right? These stores get all the view and these stores don't get any. So a lot of little factors like that. This is Cedar Rapids, which was half one way, all four lane. And the discussion here is about both one way and the number of lanes. It's a downtown that had enough traffic for a one for a one or two lane, a one or two lane street system. And so we're slowly converting as as they repave. Um, we're slowly converting this system, and we're using all paint. I always say, don't rebuild, restripe. And they were going to spend three million dollars rebuilding one street. And I said, let's spend nothing. You know, let's use your, your let's use your annual public works outlays, and as we repave and as we repaint, 
let's restripe it, and let's restripe it to a two to a two lane two way system entirely, except for the one state highway at the top. So four lanes go to two lanes, and when you change a four lane system to a two lane system, you can add sixty percent more on street parking, which is great for businesses, um, and have a much more robust bike network. The value of on street parking to businesses is disputed in the sense that people don't know whether it's a million or a billion dollars. <laughs> I'm exaggerating, but a study, from the, a study from 15 years ago valued each on-street parking space at $10,000 per, per year per nearby merchant. A more recent study by Bob Gibbs said that in, in, in vibrant downtown areas, very much like your downtown, each on-street parking space equates to $150,000 to $200,000 in revenue for the stores around it. I was on, what's the street with your bookstore on it? I was on Fleet Street yesterday. There's a point where Fleet Street imperceptibly narrows from 20, roughly 28 feet to roughly 27 and a half feet as it nears an intersection by that bookstore. And what happened is you have an eight foot standard. Even though cars are six feet wide and many of your parking spaces are seven feet wide. You have an eight foot standard, and I'm presuming that the reason Fleet Street has no parking for this block is because it doesn't have eight feet. Well, trust me, you could have you could have a twenty five foot street and you could still have two lanes of traffic moving slowly and a parking space. That needs to have the parking put back, and then that bookstore and the other businesses there will do a lot better um, in that location. Now this is Lowell, Mass, and Eric, where's Eric Hebe? Uh, Eric's responsible for making this happen, but I did a plan um, for downtown Lowell where we converted the one-way system to two-way, and it took four years, and I woke up one morning, and they had just done it. And they converted all these streets, and uh, you know, everyone feared, everyone, and Eric, Eric made it happen, but everyone feared Carmageddon, and the biggest, the biggest fear on Merrimack was, well, where are the beer trucks going to park? It's a legitimate fear, but they did the work, and Rick Chelman did the analysis, and they found specific loading areas along the curb, and they fixed the problem, and they did this, and um, so it's, I'm sorry, the, the befores are sunny and the afters are rainy, so adjust your perception. But a street, you know, this street became this, and this street, which was a raceway, absolute raceway, Market Street, became this. And there's been a lot of changes um, since, well, let's not say there's been a lot of changes since. There's been no, com no complaints, no injuries, no um, bad news, and a perceptible uptick in the occupancy of the businesses, and a lot more making out is what I noticed when I was there. <laughs> I had to take this picture quickly. This was on Market Street. This was on, no one would have made out on this street, I can promise you. <laughs> so. Um, and then I'm working in New Albany, Indiana, where the citizens, this isn't my sign, you know, the citizens get it. And there's this huge, huge campaign in New Albany where, you know, we want two-way streets now for safety, walkability, property values, and the, the businesses also get it. You know, they want the success that comes with two-way traffic. So when it comes to your downtown, then, what do you do? You can't fix this whole system because some of the streets are just too narrow. And it could be argued, there are certain areas, I need a stick. <laughs> I'll just fling my arms around. There are certain areas where it's just. Oh, great. So there's certain areas, for example, on Daniel, where theoretically two-way traffic is possible, but I don't think you'll accept it on nine-foot lanes, even though you, maybe you should. Certain areas where it probably needs to stay one way. And there's this incredible concatenation here, which probably shouldn't change because of the split that's coming on and off the bridge. But people look at these splits and they say, how do we fix that? And the answer is you don't have to fix it. You just have to go a block back. And you can introduce the two-way a block back. So what I proposed, based on a little bit of study, ignore this, oops, ignore this arrow disappearing. I just forgot to draw it on the second one. Ignore that. But what you see is State Street introducing two-way just to that point. And you see 
um, I'm sorry, uh, Con Congress Street introducing two-way just to this point, and then you need Pleasant to become two-way, which it should anyway, in order to be able to turn off of it when you get to the place where you can't go two-way anymore. Now, State Street would be much better for businesses and would function much better and be much safer if it were two-way. Um, Daniel Street, this is actually almost 20 feet. But it's not real. I mean, but it's, it's, it's. I think I think Rick Chelman has shown a way to make this work. I'm being less ambitious, but I think I believe there's a point down here, where it narrows even further. This is near the bridge. I believe further down it gets even narrower. So you'd be looking at two way, then one way, then two way, which doesn't make much sense to me. So that's why I've waited until you get to Congress to make it two way. Um, I think it believes. I believe it gets quite narrow right there. And then here's Congress, which has tons of space, and even room for a center turn lane, which makes the two-way traffic more efficient. That's here. Then there's Pleasant. And I mean, t I mean to be honest, you know, with the exception of State Street, these, do not, these streets don't feel dangerous. But I think they'd be more vital. People would be, have more choices. And I was thrilled to hear the, the deputy fire chief say that actually two-way is a much better solution for them. Because on here, if this is two-way and the bridge is up, then they have a whole opposing lane. You know, no cars are coming over the bridge. They have a whole second lane to use that's empty to get past all the traffic. So that was delightful to hear. So that's my recommendation. And I would talk to Rick Chelman to see what his recommendation is. But it's just paint and signals. And I'll talk about the signals in a minute. Last night I told people I was going to talk about something that would save them money, and then I didn't because it wasn't in the show, but it's in today's show. The other thing is just from an, uh, where am I going with this? Oh, yeah. I'm disappointed that you've snipped this intersection. This is a whole other segment of my talk that I'm not going to give you, but there's clear evidence that more complex intersections are safer than, and more complex driving environments are safer than simpler driving environments. It has to do with something called risk homeostasis and that people adjust their behavior to the level of risk that they're comfortable with. It's the reason why poisonings went up when baby-proof medicine lids were introduced. It's the reason why traffic deaths went down when Sweden switched from driving on the left-hand side of the street to the right-hand side of the street because people were scared. It took five years for traffic deaths to reach their old level as people got used to this. If you really care about lives, we should switch from sides of the street every five years <laughs> in this country. But the clipping, the clipping of this intersection, where you used to be able to come in and go out, is a typical traffic engineer's response, maybe not yours, but typical American traffic engineer's response, to what's perceived of as a dangerous environment. When it's precisely the possibility that a car might turn to enter or exit this parking lot, that causes people to drive more safely and makes it safer for everybody. Now, I do believe that, that one-way traffic in this direction is extremely useful to make this a real roundabout, effectively. You've got half a roundabout here. You don't need both. And I'll be talking in a minute about how um, I would close half of this and why. But I, uh, that's the other part of my recommendation, is that, is that actually one of these is, is not needed if it's no longer a parking lot, which it shouldn't be. Then there's the width of the streets themselves and the fact that the standards have just changed. The typical road to the typical subdivision in America allows you to witness the curvature of the earth. And this is the 1960s, this is the 1980s, same height. Look what's happened to the standards. And there's a lot of reasons for this, but the new standards cause you know, great old neighborhoods to be undermined. So this is my old neighborhood in South Beach where the road wasn't draining properly, so we had to redo the drainage, but the new standard kicked in and we lost our street trees and half our sidewalk. Because as these standards have increased on a street that functioned perfectly well, one of the, one of the reasons, I believe, was the Universal Fire Code recommending a 20-foot clear. But the Universal Fire Code is based on cul-de-sac sprawl, where there's only one path to every fire. The 20 feet comes from getting two trucks past each other in a cul-de-sac. And so it shouldn't be applied to, to, to networks, because people go faster on 
wider streets. And I was having this conversation with your, your deputy fire chief. It's just really important, and he understands this, but it's really important for everyone to understand that response time is only one part of your health and safety. And that look at your deaths and injuries in this community. If you're like the rest of America, then the single leading cause of death for a huge segment of the population is car crashes. And those car crashes are a function of people speeding in environments that often invite speeding. And so if you're widening a street to speed an emergency vehicle in a way that makes people drive, everyone drive faster, and that's causing more injuries and death, then actually you have a conflict between, there, there exists a conflict between response time and public safety. And wouldn't it be better, rather than getting to the accident fast, if there were no accident? And so it's a pretty complicated arithmetic, but in most places I've worked, having a slightly slower response time, forgive me, I will burn in hell, having a slightly slower response time um, ultimately creates a safer community, and a healthier community. So what about the deaths from heart attack or obesity or the other illnesses that come from not walking around? And if you widen the street that makes it less pleasant to walk on, you're undermining your social health in that way. So it's important to broaden, broaden the perspective and think about the long-term big picture ramifications of widening streets. Citizens understand this. Um, and this is a study that was done that tells us that, that, that documented how wider, wider streets kill people. Um, you know, how much time, how much, how often does a society have to repeat a mistake to learn a lesson from that mistake? Um, citizens understand this. This is Birmingham, Michigan. Um, cities like Portland have skinny streets programs. And then when we're building new subdivisions, which are really new, new, new towns, new neighborhoods, new mixed-use neighborhoods, um, we fight for this, which is called a yield street. It's not 20 feet clear. It's 12 feet clear. It's, tra it's travel in both ways and, of course, in both directions. New England is famous for these streets. They're called yield streets because you have to pull over into the parking lane when there's a car coming at you. But that's exactly the, the street you want to live on because your kid is safe playing in that street or near that street. The developer, Vince Graham, shows this at conferences, and he quotes this philosopher who says, broad is the road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the road that leads to life. And um, it's true. So the ITE has the standard now for urban streets, not for, little, not for little residential streets with low density that can be yield streets, but for your typical urban street, the new standard, which used to be the old standard, is 10 feet. This, this document, now about maybe six, five years old, said 10 feet to 11 feet, which in many communities was, was still great, because a lot of communities are requiring 12-foot lanes. Um, and it's been adopted by the Federal Highway Administration. Montgomery County is just in, in Maryland has just introduced a 10-foot standard for all streets. And then look at this. This is, what do you call it? This is bootleg. This is the upcoming, oops, this is the upcoming ITE engineering handbook, right? The handbook that engineers, that's the standard handbook that engineers use. It's not out yet. And this was taken at a conference by someone of a person who's working on the handbook presenting the handbook. And what it's going to say is that 10 feet should be the default width for general purpose lanes of 45 miles per hour or less. So there you have it. So if you're requiring any more than 10 feet anywhere, you're out of date. So look around and look for places where your lanes are too big because that represents an opportunity. Google Earth allows you to measure curb to curb. Here's three lanes in 41 feet. So there's room for a parking lane here up against this turn lane. With, no, with zero reduction in capacity, you could add parking to this street, make it more useful, make it safer. Here's just one block of Fleet Street where there's no parking allowed. And it's basically two almost 16 foot wide lanes. So you could add parking back on one side of this street with no reduction in capacity and a safer street. So do an inventory. Look for those opportunities. But these are two of them. Middle Street has maybe five or six extra feet in it, and it's being properly considered and planned to be a bike route. And here's a snapshot <coughs> of one solution, which is the best solution for making the biking uh, facility because it's a buffered cycle track. So let's talk about biking. 
which I describe as the single greatest revolution currently underway in only some American cities. And you're already doing a lot here. And the plans afoot for, for Middle Street are really important. And there's, there's contention around these plans. There's going to be a battle around these plans. And the question is, you know, how much do we push for the best solution? This is Portland, Oregon, famously bikeable, as you know. They bike 15 times as much as the rest of the country. Back in the 70s, they biked almost no more than the rest of the country. But they invested in cycle infrastructure. The principal determinant of biking population is bicycle infrastructure. Okay? So if you pay for it, you get the bikers. So this is the bicycle commute. I asked my friend Tom Brennan to send me some pictures of the bike commute in Portland. And he sent me these slides, and I said, was this, was this bike to work day? And he said, no, it's just Tuesday in Portland. Um, but this is the gold standard. This is the buffered bike lane. You pull, this is Chicago. You pull the parking 11 feet or so, or 10 feet. We have one in DC where it's 3 and a half, 3 and a half, and 3. This happens to be probably 4, 4, 3. You pull the parking off the curb, and then it becomes this barrier of steel that protects the cyclists. And these are what get the women and children cycling. These are what generate the biking population, if you want to have a biking population. The, the, the statistics are really interesting. This is one in New York City where they reduced a three-laner to a two-laner. And of course, more cyclists. Of course, fewer speeders. Injuries to all users, pedestrians, cyclists, and drivers was down 63%. But shockingly, this street handles no fewer cars, no lower volume of cars than it did before. I'm not sure why, but it's really interesting that you change a two-laner to a, a three-laner to a two-laner, and the throughput is still just as good for just vehicles, not, not bikes. The bikes are an addition. So if you believe, as they do in Pasadena, Pasadena doesn't do everything right. If you believe that every like, lane is a bike lane, then really no lane is a bike lane. And this is the only cyclist I met in Pasadena. So I like to say it's not a cult. In Denver, they're demanding, you know, the tech companies are locating where there are bike lanes. This is, this is a cleaning service in Washington, D.C. that I stumbled across in my favorite bike lane. You know you've hit critical mass when this is happening. Um, and the weather is not as big a factor as you may think. But what's interesting is it's better to be in a cold climate than in a hot climate. I had lunch with the guy who invented walk score. Do you guys know walk score? If you don't, go home and Google your address. Go to walkscore.com and look up your address and see what your walk score is. But I had lunch with him, and it was the rainiest day in 50 years in Seattle. And he shows up on a bike in all this great equipment. And he said, my mother said, there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad gear. And when you have bad weather, you can, you can gear up. When you have hot weather, it's a lot harder. So this is a map, then, of summer temperatures and winter temperatures across the 50 states. And you see there's absolutely zero correlation between the temperature and how much people are biking. And it's principally a function of whether people are investing in cycle facilities, which can just be paint. They don't have to be built, especially when there's the availability of parallel parking to protect the bike lane. So this is the best solution of the ones that are being considered for this street. And even if no one parks in these spaces, because in certain parts of this street there's no demand for parking, even if no one parks, having 10 feet between the traffic and you is much better, for example, than having a buffered lane on each side where there's only three feet between the cars and you. And here's the cross section. Driving, driving, parking, painted area, biking. So remember, this is the, this is the, this is the data. Th these are the outcomes you want. You won't get these outcomes from the integrated bike lanes that sit between the traffic and the parked cars. Parked cars are so important. They're a barrier of steel that protects the sidewalk from moving vehicles. This is Fort Lauderdale. This is happy hour. Parking on this side, no parking on that side. This is the parked side. This is the unparked side. You find this all over. It's almost impossible to have sidewalk dining where there isn't that barrier of steel. And similarly, pedestrians are not comfortable when the cars are not present. Think about that stretch of State Street, which we need to add the parking onto. And then the other part of this picture is the trees. Trees used to be fought by engineers. They're called FHOs, fixed and hazardous objects. 
because of the clear zone. The clear zone, you need, if you go off the road, you need to be able to correct your path. Of course, the clear zone is also the sidewalk where people are walking. But the latest studies have shown, actually, that street trees make places safer because trees slow cars down, sometimes dramatically. But a study in Orlando showed that the part of, the, of a street that had trees against it actually had fewer injury accidents than the part that didn't because of the behavior of the drivers when the street trees were there. And then just all the little details. So I love this. This is objective journalism. Some say the entrance to city center is not inviting to pedestrians. You don't say. But the point is that whenever you have, and this is, this is my beef against roundabouts. You're, you're, I think you're about to build one in a place where it probably makes sense on the edge of, your, on the, edge of the heart of your downtown. But you, in, the, in the center of your downtown, in your walkable areas, you don't want to have any, you don't want to have stream, stream form geometrics. You don't want to have aerodynamic shapes, swoops, because they communicate automotive motion. And they don't communicate a pedestrian environment. It's a dynamic environment. This is why I like to say that roundabouts are the, most, are the safest, most, most pedestrian friendly automotive environment that you can create, because they still communicate motion. And then there's this. And this is taken from one of the proposals for your bike lane on, on Middle Street. But it could be anywhere in the city. And this is something that just is so, so important. Why do you have to swoop right before you turn left? On a highway, if you're going 50, this is the proper solution. This is a high speed solution that absorbs high speeds and welcomes high speeds to a left-hand turn lane. This is something that's being planned right now in the city of Portsmouth that is dead wrong. It eliminates any parallel parking that you would have in this zone. It super lengthens the impact of the left-hand turn lane and encourages speeding and it has drivers kick into a highway mentality. This is a street in, in um, Lancaster, Pennsylvania where I'm working right now. It's the same thing. It's a neighborhood street and someone is referring to some en engineering manual which is having us apply highway standards in urban locations where you have to, thank God this beer truck is here illegally, you have to swoop right to go left. All this wasted space, all this encouragement to speed, this is what a typical left-hand turn lane used to look like. You've got plenty of these in your city now. They're all over. It's just, you, you know, you, you, you get rid of 50 feet of parallel parking, you stop the parking and you widen the street. This is the, you know, under 50 mile an hour solution to the left-hand turn lane. So when I come back here in however many years in the future, I don't want to see any swoops in your, in your new streets. This is just completely wrong. Completely wrong. Then there's just other details. <laughs> you know. This is an argument against the specialist. The specialist will destroy the city. You know, yes, you know, this street will be bone dry within 30 seconds of the 100-year flood. But I'm interested in the non, I'm interested in the non-emergency condition which every day is determining how safe the place is for pedestrians. And then there's signals. This is a sculpture. This is not a real place. <laughs> but very interesting data, very interesting data on signals, which I just discovered this year. You know, with the exception of, with the exception of Boston, there's hardly a walkable city in America that has push buttons. It's principally the unwalkable cities that have push buttons because they're part of a system in which the car rules. And generally, you don't need them uh, in walkable places. Sometimes they're just wrong. <laughs> so this was a study in, in Philadelphia where signals were, were removed and four-way stops were put in. I like to say the four-way stop is the, new, is the new roundabout. 472 signals were removed and replaced with stop signs, mostly four-way stop signs. Data was collected on 200. Crashes were reduced by 24%. Severe injury crashes, 63%. Severe pedestrian injury crashes went down more than two-thirds. When you replace the signal, which gives people confidence, with the stop sign that causes everyone to enter the intersection cautiously and creates eye contact between the pedestrians and the cyclists and the cars, the four-way stop is a wonderful tool. This is funny. Traffic engineers in Philadelphia believe that the safety benefit stems from elimination of the local habit of speeding up to beat the red. Here in Pennsylvania, we speed up to beat the red. In this study of, um, of Cedar Rapids, by changing, this, by changing the, the one-way system to a two-way system, 
it means that you never have more than, you need to have a signal when you have more than one lane entering an intersection from any one direction. But when there's only one lane entering an intersection from each direction, the four-way stop functions. Certainly with the traffic volumes you have here, the four-way stop functions. And so you also, what about left-hand turn lanes? Well, a left-hand turn lane is completely useless and, in fact, confusing at a four-way stop because the person turning left is just waiting their turn and then they're going. So that's another thing you can get rid of is the left-hand turn lane. So in this condition, when you go uh, from this to this, there are actually three signals that would go away. It'll probably pay for the whole thing because you pay a lot of money maintaining your signals and replacing your signals. So put in the paint, adjust the, removing, adjust the remaining signals, and just get rid of these three signals. Okay, we're done with the safe walk. <laughs> so the last two categories are pretty quick, uh, the comfortable walk and the interesting walk. The comfortable walk has to do with that all humans crave spatial definition. We like wide open spaces and great views, but we, we need to feel enclosed. This is in your, your bones. It's in your DNA. You can't, you've, we've survived this long as a species because we, we know to, to like environments in which our flanks are covered. We want to feel protected from our predators which these days are vehicles. So, you know, we pay a lot of money to go to places like Venice, and this happens to be split in Croatia because of, actually this is, all the, the, the um, evolutionary biologists tell us that all, all animals, not just humans, seek out prospect and refuge. This happens to be both, which is why it's so spectacular. But this ratio of height to width is very important. We've been talking about it as new urbanists for a long time. Beyond six to one, you start to lose your sense of enclosure. Street trees help a lot. Um, one to six can be spectacular. This is Salzburg, which is further north than here. and still wonderful with these shaded but shaped streets. The opposite of Salzburg is Houston. Houston's come a long way since this photo was taken. But the main point here is that you can't let your surface parking lot undermine your street edge. You have a number of places with your, sorry, PNC Bank, TD Bank, and other places in your downtown where the streetscape's kind of wrecked because of an exposed parking lot, it would be great to build an edge on and be a much more comfortable space. And then there's the idea of the missing, not just the missing tooth, but the missing nose. And how actually zoning codes in many cities, and that was the case in DC, made it effectively illegal to build on this lot. So I made that a personal mission. And I got five, five variances and did this, which is my house, and um, which I no longer live in. Uh, but um, uh, it was against the law. But of course, sometimes you have to break the law to uh, get recognized. <laughs> so um, this is your circumstance where this is much improved. Well, some people feel these buildings are out of scale, but in terms of an edge, this is the entry to your city from the state of Maine. And not only having not substantial buildings here, but this parking lot in front. It's kind of a, it's a weak welcome. It's not a very um, nice spot. And even as proposed, do you really want the first thing people see when they come into Portsmouth to be this exposed parking lot? So not knowing, not having seen this image and realizing that these people will never let their views be blocked, I propose this transformation. And what this suggests is that you take half the parking lot away so this becomes a street, it completes the roundabout, and you make this a building site. And you put a building there, and then you've got a, a, noble, a noble entry into your community. However, these guys now will never let that happen. So the question is, you know, how can you relocate this whole parking lot and have a green there? Because that's what you really want if you're going to enter this place beautifully. Then finally, the interesting walk has to do with, with we humans are among the social primates. Nothing interests us more than other humans. We want signs of human habitation. Um, no one takes this engagement photo. This is a planner who was having some fun and was trending on Twitter. Um, because it's boring, it's repetitive. And you know, this, this is called a snout house, right? But the idea of the house with the garage door in front, it doesn't speak, it doesn't say people live here, it says cars live here, right? We want signs of people. So one-to-one -one is pretty ideal, but this is one-to-one. And this is the street that connects the two biggest hotels in Grand Rapids, which is a very walkable downtown. But as I like to say, when one side of the street is an exposed parking deck and the other side is 
a conference facility that was apparently designed in, in admiration <laughs> for the exposed parking deck, um, then people aren't going to want to walk there. And Mayor Riley taught us it only takes 20 feet of building to hide 200. Mayor Riley in Charleston, mayor for 40 years, was one of the pioneers in forcing parking garages to be hidden behind buildings. And you, you know that here. You need to make sure any new parking garages that you build do something like this. This is the Chia, I call it the Chia Pet Garage in South Beach. Same idea. Um, but here you've inherited this condition. I didn't get to paste this, but I'm guessing it's 12 feet. So you're kind of stuck with it. I mean, because what can you build in 12 feet that's at all decent? Oh, I don't know. Maybe that? Maybe that? That's my house, my old house. 12 feet is the perfect width for a room. So the idea that you could stick build some sort of residences against the edge of this garage, completely hiding it and providing some attainable housing in your downtown is one I'd like to see pursued. 12 feet's an amazing measure. And then there's this project, which I'd like to end with, which is called the Cap at Union Station. It's in Columbus, Ohio. And it just demonstrates how important it is to feel enclosed and to be interested as you walk, because these two neighborhoods were completely disconnected. This was the, this is the convention center. There's a big sports facility up here. Lots of people walking. No one was crossing the bridge into the short north, which was this, um, is this kind of ethnic restaurant, uh, you know, good restaurant neighborhood, good shop restaurant. You know, when you're a conventioner, you want to buy something for your spouse, but no one was crossing the bridge because the bridge looked like this. And, you know, nothing but the the windswept experience and, and the suicide screen, you know, as you walk along. Um, but when the state rebuilt the highway, the city gave the state an extra um, $1.9 million. But they had to rebuild not the highway, but the bridge. And they built the bridge like 80 feet wider and then gave the site to a developer who built this. And now these two neighborhoods are seamlessly connected. You cross the highway, you don't even know it. And of course, these things are happening in other places, parts of Boston. This has been done over the Mass Pike. But the point is that whenever you have walkability that's near walkability and just one bad spot in between, and it may be, might just be like a couple gas stations, it doesn't have to be a, a highway gully, that, that, that's where the investments pay off the most in walkability because you're doubling the length of a corridor, which quadruples the area that's walkable. So that's the full list. Um, you know, you've got so much going for you already that you do have to be a little bit wary about gilding the lily, but I think there's certain obvious things in terms of just the safety, just the safety of your downtown streets um, that I've already that I've mentioned. That this is just from you know a day spent on Google, you know googling, go googling myself around your downtown, and then a little bit of walking around. That the things I've showed you are things I found in that limited amount of time. If someone were to set out to say, let's do the inventory of extra lanes, let's do the inventory of missing parking, let's do the inventory of lanes that are too wide, and then let's really consider our one-way system, I think there's a lot of simple, inexpensive changes that could be made in the next couple years that would make this a much better place for walking around and more vital. So there you have it. I hope to see you over the book signing table. If you're a real junkie, some of you, I saw someone carrying this. Today, almost no one has this book, but I do recommend it. It's, it's called the Smart Growth Manual. It's also known as All the Things That People Get Wrong Manual, that you shouldn't get wrong. Um, and then this book is the whole sprawl versus towns argument. Um, and particularly for this group, I should mention, I teach a course, a two-day course at Harvard every summer. So um, it would be very convenient for you to come down, spend one night, one expensive night, in Cambridge, and um, uh, the course is not cheap, but they give you a certificate that looks really like a Harvard diploma <laughs> with a Harvard seal on it. And you put that behind your desk and it's really great. So it's worth every penny to come to the course. And it's a nice small course. It's just a dozen people and we really get to, it's basically this, but two days of this, including a nice walking tour of Boston. Um, so there you have it. There's my website. And then I love Twitter followers like anyone on Twitter. So. Please, um, please do that. And now let's, let's um, I've left five whole minutes for questions. I, I, I'll stay as long as people want to stay. 
Although when many of you start leaving, I'm going to run to the book table uh, so I can sign your books. I don't want to miss that. But uh, let's, let's start the questions. And Pete has a microphone. This is being recorded. This is being recorded, so um, you need to be mic'd to be heard. Uh, please um, stand up if you have a question. Oh, and there's one more thing I want to say. Sorry, I forgot to mention it. I'll try and do it in 60 seconds. There's that parking lot over there across the, across the pond. Oh, yeah, the what? Okay, I can't say that word. There's a lot. Parrot. Parrot lot. Okay, parrot lot. And you've got, what you've got there is a beautiful pond, a beautiful public space that's inadequately shaped by buildings. It's nowhere near as nice as it could be because it has that bad edge, and that parking lot is ruining the edge. Also, the view that everyone loves of looking over the lake, the, the pond, at, to the city hall is ruined because there's a parking lot in front of it. And as I understand, and this is about the spatial definition discussion, I don't think people understand how much better that would be as an asset in your community if it was properly shaped. And also what a useful site that is for, for, for example, a parking deck if properly lined by beautiful buildings on both sides of that block. Now, I was discussing it with some folks and they said, oh, people didn't want their views of the, law of the lake blocked. People didn't want their views of the church steeple blocked. View corridors are very important and they are important. And wherever you are in a city, you can stand in any location and say, we need to preserve that view. That's an argument that makes sense in any one location. But when you add it up over the entirety of a city, it is a completely destructive Im impediment to making a beautiful city. View corridors cannot be allowed to, to rule the, the, the growth of your city because they actually stop making your, they, they prohibit making your city better. And that's a location that is so clear to me, and this is why I love to give my talks and leave town. That's a location, that's a location where it's so clear to me that the organized neighborhood that's fighting against that lot is acting in its own self-interest against the interest of your city and preserving an eyesore that would be an asset if we had, if we made people wait a little bit longer it's like Japanese landscape design. You don't expose the whole view to everyone all the time. You have to arrive, and then it's a miracle, right? The landscape changes as you move through it because vistas close and open up. And that's a prime example of a directive which makes sense on a site-by-site -site basis, making no sense when you apply it to a way of approaching the design of a city. So I've made my point. Question. Um, th I, thank you very much for uh, is this on? for uh, speaking to the one-way street system in Portsmouth. Um, I've lived here a long time. Every time I come in, I hate it. It's awful. Um, I don't understand why Portsmouth has these one-way streets. Thank you. And I, I'm confident that as a result of your coming, that is going to change. And that's going to, in a, in a, at low cost, significantly improve the quality of the city. It's amazing. So my only question is, uh, my colleagues in Portsmouth are probably already on it. They're smart. I'm sure they get it. But if they're not already on it, is it as simple as maybe they hire Rick Chelman and he just comes in and gives them a plan and they change the one-way streets to two-way and then they make some of these other improvements? Yeah, I mean, you won't be able to get away with it publicly without a, stu without a traffic study. And the traffic study is only as good as the study year. Now, Rick Chelman happens to work for Nelson Nygaard, which is probably the most respected traffic engineering firm in the country. And um, the only problem is if you hire the wrong firm, they're going to tell you you can't do it. So uh, I don't know what that process needs to be. Uh, I would hire a firm. I, I think it's, you know. <laughs> I did a walkability study for um, West Palm Beach. And, I have some, and it's available online. If you Google Jeff Speck West Palm Beach walkability study, you can probably find it. Um, but I put some language in there that's really important. And basically, there's never, ever been an example of any city in America that has ever reverted its traffic from one way to two way and had a problem. It's never gone wrong. So you need to hire a firm that's done it before, that's seen the results, and uh, can speak from that experience. If you hire a firm that has not had experience in making those reversions and seeing them succeed, then you're 
likely to end up with a recommendation that's based on theory and not on experience and logic. Okay. Next. Hi, Jeff. Um, I had a couple questions, um, I guess more comments, about how we're analyzing the spatial experience of our city. I think a lot of the times, maybe in the past, we've been burned and then on the, the heights of the buildings. And now we're kind of concentrating, I think, on how the height of the building has to be equal to what's near it. And I'm wondering how we go about looking at that as what's in front of it, what the experience of the street is in front of it, and how we create those proportions. Maybe a two-story or a three-story isn't appropriate because the street is on is wider yeah. and it can be there. I'm just wondering if you have any experience with starting to raise some of those heights in a respectful manner. Yeah, I mean, it's a hot, hot button issue. <laughs> Question spoken like a true designer <laughs> in recognizing that the width of the street should be a key determinant of the height of the street. Many cities historically have had zoning codes or building codes like New York City and Washington DC where the height of the buildings is determined by the width of the street because you want to have that, that spatial definition. I do believe though that context is very important um, and I think that character is very important. And I think the biggest complaints that you hear about, for example, um, Port Walk, are, uh, and they're, they're legitimate complaints and they're accurate complaints have to do with character. And, and how it's, from a, from a city planning view, there's really not much wrong with that project. <laughs> but from a, from, a, from a character point of view, there's a lot wrong with that project. And there's some simple decisions that have been made that are really hard to regulate where things could have been done better. Now, the principal, I'll, I'll try and say this very quickly. The principal challenge in fitting into a neighborhood is understanding the historic scale of buildings and communicating with that scale. When you have a block, a typical block in Portsmouth in your downtown, it's probably broken into, let's say, three, three buildings, which is why that infill building, which, is, which I like, which is called what? Popover? Popover? On, Market on, on Market Square. Well, the architect is here. Raise your hand. Brilliant architect. Is that, that, does anyone know this building I'm talking about? is so good because it, under, it looked around and it said, what's the increment of investment? What's the increment of building? And let's make a new building that's divided convincingly into buildings that are, the, that are the same size. So half of it is picking the right increment, which, which Port Walk mostly gets wrong. It has a building that's too big, conceptually. I mean, it's all one building, but it has a, it has a facade that's too long, and then it has a facade that's broken down into like 12-foot increments of, of fairyland you know, different architectures. So the first thing is getting the increment right. The second thing is composing each building as its, each, each segment as its own building. The other thing that Port Walk gets wrong is, is if you're on that center street, which has the buildings on both sides of it with a slight bend in it, and you look up to your left as you're leaving town, there's a salmon-colored building with a crisscross detailing on the elevation. That's about the right size. And the cornice is different, and the roof is different, and the windows are different. But you look at it, it was not composed as a facade. No architect worth a damn would have designed an individual building with you know, a big window, a big window, a small window, and a big window, or whatever it is, completely asymmetrical, which asymmetry is fine, but it needs to be balanced. The windows are really close to the edge. You would never see windows like that hammered up against, wall-eyed against the edge of the building. There's all these things that make it not convincing as an individual facade. So if you're, if you're going to ask your architects to design buildings that fit in, even build big buildings that fit in, you need to make sure that the, the divisions are a proper size, but then that each piece of the building is, is composed as a building, as opposed to just a bunch of windows thrown on a wall. Next question. Uh, if I might, I have three questions. Now you get one because there's, there's so many people here. All right. Um, and you've asked me 10 already, which I've enjoyed. But. All right. <laughs> All right. So, so the, the most important question, I think, is we've got a proposal for a large development with a Whole Foods, and they, part of the traffic study was uh, indicating it's adding a signalized in intersection where we were talking about the Roundup possibly going yesterday at Market Street and, and Russell. Uh, so I really noticed what you said about signalized <laughs> intersections, removing them, putting stop signs in, right? So I if signalized intersections are proposed to, to deal with overloaded intersections, which is what they're doing at that end, how can we put stop signs in at crossing Congress Street, where Maplewood crosses Congress Street and State Street, how does that work out? Well, once you hit a certain volume, 
you can't have stop signs anymore. And that, that particular location may be at that volume. So my main argument for stop signs is not one of efficiency, but one of safety and comfort. That said, below a certain volume, stop signs are, are very, you know, people think, oh, it's going to slow traffic down. Actually, what happens, like what we're doing in, in, Cedar, in Cedar Rapids, where we're replacing 11 of the 17 signals with stop signs, is that the calculations suggest you'll get through the downtown faster. Because while you're never, while you're never, you know, while you're, 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 you, while you have to stop at every intersection, you never have to wait at an intersection. So systematically, stop signs are pretty efficient. But there's a certain point at which you get a certain level of traffic, in which case signals can, can be more efficient. So I'm not suggesting that the stop signs are necessarily more efficient. Roundabouts, and that's a location because it's a little bit on the periphery of the downtown. That's a location where a roundabout might make sense. And roundabouts are extraordinarily efficient. That's why roundabouts have, have promulgated, you know, have, have appeared all over the U.S. because traffic engineers love them because they really churn the traffic through in, in a safe way. So um, that might be a better solution for in that area. Next. Oh, come on. Joe gets another question. No one raises their hand. There we go. So thank you. Um, it seemed last night and again today that um, you were talking about re actually bringing congestion into the city. And one of the things that many committees, including, well, <laughs> many committees have been working on is to get the car congestion out of downtown. And if you were, I invite you to come in the summer and see what it's like, as was mentioned last night, when the bridge goes up yeah, every I've, half I've done hour. It. Yeah, I've done it. And then a lot of pedestrian traffic, a lot. So I'm looking at Fleet Street and Chapel that you commented on, and I wondered why you wouldn't widen the sidewalks instead of making parking along those streets. Uh, because that costs more money. So it's probably a better, it's, it's, there's a couple of arguments, there's a couple of discussions to have, which I'll have, which I'll have very quickly. Um, the first is that um, if, the, if the pedestrian congestion is so high that people are walking in the street, then that's definitely the safer alternative. I have to say, you know, when we were looking at in front of the bookstore at that street which lost the parking because it lost a foot of cart path, it was suggested that we widen the sidewalk. My response was I'd rather have a five-foot sidewalk protected by cars than a 13-foot sidewalk not protected by cars in terms of feeling safe. That said, if you've got crowding and people are falling off the curb, um, it's m obviously much safer to, wider the sidewalk, to widen the sidewalk. The reason I usually recommend the bike lane or the parking is that it's a paint solution as opposed to a construction solution. And whenever you move a curb, you also get into drainage issues in this whole underground network that has to be considered. And so you can restripe, you know, for the price of rebuilding one street, you can restripe a whole neighborhood. And so that's why I tend to just go for the cheap, low-hanging fruit. But certainly wider sidewalks uh, probably make sense in certain locations. And a street like, like um, Chapel, um, it might very well make sense. Next. All right, I'll give Joe one more question. Um, this is a hot button, but um, you were talking about parking being public good, public service. Um, uh, are, are there examples in other parts of the country where in lieu of fees have been successfully used as a tool to... Yeah, I understand that... Uh, oh, I, I'm glad you asked that question. In lieu of fees, I understand have been tried here and not succeeded. Uh, places where it succeeded have been like uh, Carmel, California, is the one I know about. But it's, it's not an uncommon thing for you to ask developers in lieu of the on-site par parking requirement to pay cash into a fund to support the construction of parking garages and other parking facilities in the downtown. It's called an in lieu of fee. In Beverly Hills, California, the in lieu of fee, I think, is $20,000 per space. So depending on how hot your market is, the more you can charge developers uh, for, for building this parking. Um, it doesn't work where it's not enforced completely uniformly and completely with no exceptions. And I understand what happened here. I won't tell you who told me. But I understand what happened here is that the city council uh, allowed certain exceptions. Once you start to allow any exceptions to an in lieu of fee, it becomes impossible to enforce 
Because then, in, in, in all fairness, you have to start providing exceptions all over the place to everyone, and then it's no longer functioning. So I, I'm, I'm not saying you should bring it back, but if you do bring it back, the only, re the only way to bring it back effectively is to make it just hard as stone with no exceptions. City Manager. Yes, uh, thank you, Jeff. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank uh, PS21 and you, Jeff, for being here. Uh, this has been a tremendous two days uh, that we've had. We've had a lot of staff here, and uh, we've had a lot of discussion internally. Uh, we've listened today, and as we go forward, we'll be working together to try to look at some of the things that you mentioned today where possible, and we'll work it through some of the committees that uh, are necessary uh, to make these things happen. So uh, this has really been a great uh, two days, and I, I'm very delighted to see the number of people have turned out and the comments, and, uh, you know, uh, the whole PS21 has done a, a wonderful job, and I want to just thank them for that, and thank you. Well, thank you all. It's been, it's been really a pleasure to be here. I'll, I'll be walking around your streets with my family this summer, so please, if you see me, come say hello. And um, I have to say, you know, I do this a lot, but this has been one of the warmest receptions and the, and the most fun I've had uh, recently doing one of these, so thank you for that also. And I'll see you outside.